podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the Ospreys Irie. Hello and welcome back to the Ospreys Irie podcast. It's episode four and URC fever is gripping the nation. Or as the general public calls it, the common cold. I am James and joining me are the usual suspects. Aaron, how are we? Fine, thank you, James. How are we? I am all right, mate. I am all right. And also joining us is the man of a thousand podcasts. Yes, Tim, how are we? It's my third of the week, so it's a little bit off a thousand, but yeah, I'm okay, albeit tired. I think at this rate you will you will be about a thousand on the weekend. Uh, you, you, how, how was appearing on the on the on the the Godfather podcast, the the, the big boy podcast, the rap? Yeah, it was a bit surreal to be uh, invited on. I thought this is my time to shine, and uh, yeah, no, good fun and um, enjoyed myself. And obviously, the West Language podcast, which was recorded before this one, so I might be a little bit tired. But uh, as always, it's a it's a it's a new season. Uh, in the URC, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I've I've been gripped by it, so yeah. How how, how was our weekend, folks? Darren, how was your weekend? Yeah, fine, thank you. Got a stinking cold, so uh, still still battling away, but uh, must go on in it. So yeah, fine, thank you. And yeah, yes, then I yeah I can't imagine this weekend from a rugby point of view. Well, Ponty had a bonus point win for some reason. They've won back to back games. Um. So that was quite interesting. Hey, it's bet. the it's the, the stalwart of our great rugby nation. Yeah, and uh, but uh, the, the World Cup quarterfinals were seriously impressive. So I could recuperate from my illnesses of last week and just enjoy three and a half quarterfinals. What was it? The best set of quarterfinals we've had. I, I can think, remember anyway. I think so. From what I can remember, obviously I'm a little bit youth, youthful and naive and don't remember much, but I think from what I can remember, it, it's definitely the best set. Well, 2019 wasn't great, but uh, yeah, I think from a rugby standpoint, for a neutral M4, just amazing. I had a decent weekend. I, um, Managed to catch all the games. Uh, managed to catch a bit of the Premiership as well. Um, so yeah, we're you know we're, we're ready for the proper rugby to be back, aren't we? Are we still allowed? Are we? Can we speak about Ethan Roots on record? Or is it? Uh, uh, as 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 an Ospreys, you know, diehard uh, as you both are, I would not like to speak about Ethan Roots because I would just be upset. I have had sleepless nights since he's left. Just, just uh, of course. For those who don't know, Ethan Root started uh, the Chiefs on the weekend and scored in their demolition against Saracens. And I, I am very sad. No Joe Hawkins though. No, Apparently no, he's injured. Know. There's no surprise there. That bloke is always injured. We still on a youth contract with Dexter as well. So. so Speaking of the weekend, and speaking of the quarterfinals, we have to talk about it. Wales v Argentina. What's what's our initial thoughts, Darren? What did, what did you think of the game? Well, I was working on thoughts on it, need, but someone was kind enough to keep us updated um throughout the game, and then when I got home, I seen some highlights, and uh, I won't go into too much uh personal, but I I heard that a few Scarlets players did mess it up for us, but I won't go. I'm not I'm not being biased. I don't want to upset anyone. But um, yeah, but no one ex- like I always like I said last time, no one expected us to get out of the group because we had Australia and Fiji. We managed to get out of the group. Um, I think we did well to get where we are. We were unfortunate maybe to lose to Argentina. No, no dis- no disrespect there. Um, all the best to them on the weekend. But um, yeah, and it's been confirmed that it uh. But not officially confirmed, but Gatlin looks like he's staying until the twenty twenty seven Australia World Cup. So that's good news. So it gives us gives him more chance to blood some youngsters in, and uh, hopefully go one step further in the next World Cup. Well, Stan, what 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 about you? What are your thoughts on uh, Wales v Argentina? 
Yeah, it's probably an opportunity missed, but I always felt that Argentina would do a performance. And I think if you look over the last, well, certainly the World Cup cycle where Czech has been involved, you know, they, you, know you, you you don't beat the All Blacks twice by pure luck, and you and and you don't perform at that high standard and and not keep. You know, they're, they're a bit inconsistent. Um, they they beat Australia in the summer, but then they narrowly avoid narrowly um defeat the Springboks. They lose by a point, and that's a game which Buffelli doesn't play in. And I think if Buffelli does play in, they probably win. And and you're thinking, oof, you know, how close they, they pushed that. And I think everyone kind of looked at Argentina from what they were against England, which I think many would have probably fallen into that trap because Argentina were very poor that, that day against England. And obviously Ford kicked the living day letter to the rugby ball and, and kicked all the points. But uh, do you just... You just knew there was something in there for Argentina that they were going to give a big performance, and unfortunately for Wales, they they did catch the set, especially the second half. They did catch a very good Argentina side. I thought. Yeah, I agree. I I think uh, the beauty of us recording on Wednesday is I've listened to the rugby podcast that I do, and I think a lot of my thoughts were confirmed. I think Wales for that first probably thirty minutes. Dominate that game. Yes. We looked on top, we looked sharp. Um, and, and then I think it all just fell apart. I think that the from the Josh Adams uh, dropping the shoulder in, in, into the Argentinian player, I think it just went downhill from there. Uh, yeah. As much as I like ragging on the Scarlets players, there's no point pinning it on Postolo or I think a lot of people are, are talking about Elias as well. Um, but, you know, all three of us are big Adam Beard fans. Um, but at the end of the day, he he does call the line out. There's got to be um, some blame shared between uh, between both players. Um, on that, though, did Gatlin get his selection wrong? Do you think maybe... He could have brought Elias on later. Do you think maybe Elliot D would have been the safer option? You know, it's, these are all things that have been discussed. Personally, I think I think he did, did really well when he came on. He gave away one stupid penalty, but name me someone who didn't make a stupid mistake on Saturday. That could have been anyone. Um, I thought he carried well. I thought you know he he, he I I'm not sure off the top of my head if he didn't if he did miss any of his darts, but I thought he played really well. And that's not to say Elias didn't play well, but it's just really hard to escape the fact that between Elias and Beard, that first one, which I think was an was an overthrow, it killed the momentum of the game. Uh, and actually, it's really weird to say that Wales performed worse than a Wales backline because I actually thought the backline played really, really well. Um, and it's clear to see that Alex King, having had that extended time with the squad, you can really see what he he's bringing to to Wales. There's some r- lovely wraparound plays, not wraparounds in just traditional Sexton mould, but a lot wider. Um, you can clearly tell Wales have been keeping something back. Problem is, maybe they should have used it against. You know your Georgias, so it's so it wasn't as fresh today. So what you know, it wasn't something that they were trying for the first time. You know, yes. Then what, what's your view on the Elias Beard situation? Where does where do you think the blame lies in the hooker or the or the lineup call? It feels like whenever those two names are, are clashed together, it feels like everyone picks a side and blames the other, which is. Not the nicest of ways to um to pick on about it when when you look when you look to the warm up game and obviously all right okay Elias didn't play you know that day Lake mm-hmm. was Lake was starting hooker and Sam Parry was on the bench and obviously Lake went off injured but the heap of the blame all went that dad and beard after that warm up defeat in Twickenham and then you you look at Saturday and you you see all the heaps piled on Elias and. 
I think probably the first and the third one, you could argue that is more Elias' fault compared to what the the jumper's doing. Uh, I think the second one is probably not many people's fault, except this really good lineup work from Argentina. To just yeah, that, that's that's yeah. something that's not talked yeah. about enough as well. When people mention lineups going wrong, there's not much claim of praise to the, towards the opposition. As as not as someone that's watched the Ospreys quite a lot over the last few years, I remember James King was predominantly good at nicking the odd lineup here and there, and for some reason managed to do it quite a lot, which was bit of a surprise from someone that's obviously a back rower, but obviously mm-hmm. shifted in that lock when he when he needed. And um and yeah, so I think people probably need to take the the slack off a little bit. Okay, those were those were free line notes, which are rather pivotal in hindsight. But there was some golden chances where the pass didn't quite go to hand or maybe an opportunity didn't quite, you know, maybe it was a pass wasn't given or something like that, which all had all came in the first half really. And then Discipline issues kick crept in and a couple of penalties were given away and all of a sudden then it's, it's game on. But I still think people need to appreciate the art of defending the line outs and, and defend them all too. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I, I think yeah. hearing you say that Argentina clearly did their homework. Um, You know, they know Beard is predominantly that middle jumper will come forward as well. And, you know, if you can out-jump someone, you're going to at least disrupt that line out. You mentioned discipline there. Aaron, have you seen the Josh Adams challenge on the Argentinian player? Do you have, a, do you have any a, thoughts on that? It was a shoulder shoulder the head, wasn't it? It wasn't to the head. It was a sh- it was just dropping the shoulder into, into someone's... Uh, into the chest. That according to Carl Dixon, there was arms. Uh, do you think it should have been a yellow card, or do you think Josh Adams was a lucky boy? Well, I can't really comment because I didn't really see it. But in rugby these days, obviously you gotta be careful. But you do have rugby incidences that may look bad on camera or may not look bad. So whatever Carl Dixon decided, then hopefully he had the right decision. Because, you know, on another day he could have seen red, but he was fortunate to see um yellow on this occasion. But then everyone's got their opinions. They might say, oh no, he was lucky he could have got away with a the red there. Or, but I think uh, Carl Dixon got a spot on and stuck with uh, his decision and just stuck to a yellow card. I think, well, because it, it wasn't, it was a penalty only to, to Argentina, which I think was the fair outcome. Um, I said, at the time, I thought it was going to be a yellow card. Um, I've seen them given, um, but I I knew when he gave a penalty only for that. That if another incident happened, that it would have a knock-on effect, and of course, so it, it it did happen. The shoulder to the head of Nick Tompkins um, by the Argentina Lavanini. It was um, Guido Petty. Guido Petty. So I'm so used to blaming Lavanini. Um, but Petty drove a shoulder into the head of Nick Tompkins. It was deemed a rugby incident by replacement referee Nick Tom uh, by Carl Dixon, the replacement referee. Jaco Piper, who pulled up with a calf injury. By the way, that is not the first time he's done that. Before, Jaco. Get up the boots. Clearly, or get a better warm up. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Yestin? Are, are you in the in the minority who agree that that's only a you know that is a play on, or are you in the yellow card region? What are you what are you thinking? Um, it's a stonewall penalty without without a shadow of a doubt, and um. Probably the example I always allude to Carl Dixon is the Ospreys Montpellier game at the start of this year, where Paul Belemse goes in on the tackle on Reese Davis. And it's either shoulder to head or head on head contact. And there's no 
nothing at all from Dixon, thinking that looks rather dangerous. We might I need to have a little look at it. And I always refer back to that moment every time I see Carl Dixon on TV, just in case something like that happens again. And I think we have seen that happen again in a, in a bit more different in a different way, of course. Um, obviously, Petty wasn't really wanting to hit Nick Tompkins, uh, but then again, he's he's made contact with him on his head. And with so much going on within the sport nowadays about head injuries, concussions, former players coming out with you know dementia and and, and CT and things like that, you must you, it was. There's times we're thinking you're scratching your head and thinking, why is he? Why is he said that not every head contact's not a foul play? Because it, it was dangerous, and, and Tompkins did have to go off for a HIA, which kind of messed wheels around a little bit. As Dan Bigger who was already in a bit of uh, injury trouble, had to move to inside centre. So I thought it was at least a penalty. You could argue maybe. A yellow card, but 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 yeah, it was, it was definitely a penalty for me. I, uh, yeah, I am agreement. Definitely a penalty, at least. Um, I don't think, you know, even in the change in frameworks and things like that, a shoulder to the head in that manner has never been a penalty. I, I, I'm actually in agreement. I haven't watched it back. It was not a yellow card. God. Um, I, I think there's enough mitigation to say that's not a that's not a pen, that's not a yellow card, but I am in stonewall agreement that's a penalty. It's, it's reckless. It's to the head. There's high dangers. It's high danger, but there's umpteen uh, amounts of mitigation. You know, so swings and roundabouts unfortunately that not being a penalty results in seven points I mean, not saying that Wales would have won that if that try doesn't stand I, I think that Wales' discipline was poor uh, and I think I still think they would have lost that I think that Argentina bringing on Sanchez bringing on Costello is that difference there because as you said Big is on one leg at that point Bin is on for HIA you know, if we had Anska maybe coming off the bench, you think that ship is steadied a bit better. You know, the, we we play we play the percentages a bit more. We play down there. Um, look, it swings and roundabouts. Argentina were by far the better team. Forty five minutes that game, and full credit to them. And I hope they go out and give a good account of themselves against um, New Zealand. Do you think? Briefly moving on, we, we, two, two more things about the, the Wales experience at the World Cup. Darren, do you think Wales have achieved what they set out to do in this World Cup? Do you think they, they've underachieved or overachieved? What do we think? Well, obviously, I don't know what they went in with a momentum of where they wanted to finish. But I think from someone from my background... Looking in on from a sports point of view, I reckon that they um achieve something together because no one expects them to get out of the group. So I think to go this far in at all in the World Cup, with everything going on in Welsh rugby, um I think we achieve something together and going into the next World Cup, hopefully we can go one step better and uh blood some more youngsters in and go in into the World Cup with more expectation than we did on ourselves this year. Yeah, I I think that that's pretty fair. Yes, then well, are you are you in agreement or do you think that there's there's a beautiful opinion about what Wales have actually achieved at this World Cup? Yeah, I think at the start of the year I think I'd have been relatively pleased with with the quarter final finish. Um Okay, at some stage Saturday afternoon, I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't capitalise on, on the on the start that they had um, to to progress through. So it's, a, it's an opportunity missed, but on the other on the flip side, it's it's definitely a good World Cup for Wales in terms of they managed to reach the knockouts. Many people thought that Fiji and Australia would beat them in in the pools, and they they they've beaten that. 
and they 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 get really good account of themselves in the quarterfinals, albeit Argentina pipping them to the post in in many aspects. It's it's a good foundation of what Gatlin probably wants to be, and they can hopefully they can build on that over the next. World Cup cycle, blood in quite a few youngsters, and um, hopefully by twenty twenty seven they'll be maybe it maybe aiming for a bit higher potentially a semi final or touch wood a, a a final. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm in agreement there. I think for me my expectations are pretty low. Minus this World Cup, we we're not in a good place as a squad. Um, I think the warm ups helped with that a bit. I think the squad settled down a bit with Gatlin coming in, the chopping and changing the pivot. Um, Harley mentioned on 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 the main pod this week. You know, I think it was only Adam Beard really who who played under pivot, and Nick Tompkins, who you know, less we Nick Tompkins and Will Rowlands, two Wales' the best players at this World Cup, were pivot finds. But Gatlin bringing in steady in the ship. Um. He tried some new players this World Cup, this World Cup cycle in the last six months. Azarati, Obachowski, Costello, uh, Keith, you know, players like that, and who, who I'm sure will come back in the fold. You know, that leads me on to where do Wales go from here? Obviously, not really counting the Barbarians game at the start of November. It's a pretty neat thing game. You know, Alan's already said that. From, from the World Cup squad game, you know, the, the, I, I don't want to look too far ahead to the Six Nations because I think it all depends on URC form for a lot of these players. But does Gatlin go gradual in his rebuild, or does he get that squad and and get in, you know, new new, new players? Darren, what do you think? Um, I think he should look at. The young players that are there now or thereabouts, like your Azaratis and your Lakes, maybe keep the like a Dan Bigger in. Um, not quite sure. Dan, Bigger's, Dan Bigger's retired from international. Oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. I forgot. You tell him for a cold and forgetting who's retired. Yeah. You know, hasn't retired. My bad. Um, hopefully, um, we see a few more youngsters given a chance. Hopefully, uh, by the time the next World Cup comes around, maybe Costello. Um, will be first choice. Who knows? Because I think we run seem to be run out of tens in Wales at the minute, don't we? Or it might be play, or we might even see them at uh, full back. And um, yeah, I reckon going to the Six Nations. I reckon he should keep most of the youngsters that he's had in the World Cup. Maybe see Plum Chico in there. Hopefully, see Kevin Williams in there. Said uh, giving him a chance in the Six Nations. Proof, you know, he's not just a regional. Uh, Stamp you can actually do it in the uh, for the big time for Wales, but yeah, we just gotta look at the next World Cup uh, starting in the Six Nations. Yeah, Stan, what about you? Gradual rebuild, or does he get that squad? Yeah, there's probably a few problem positions. Um, as we mentioned, ten. It feels like Sam Cost- Costello is the only one we've got left, even though there there is obviously other options. You've got Owen Williams, who's who's obviously back at the Ospreys. You've got Callum Sheedy, who can't get a game at Bristol, which is quite the concern. But I think fullback's another issue as well. We've had so much of Liam Williams and Lee Arpenny, just a guarantee every week to be at fullback, regardless of fitness and injuries. They, they, they've always been there. And I feel like, you know, you've got, there's a couple of, in you know, the next crop that's coming through, you've got, you could beat them coming at a, a Cardiff, but there's there's a bit of a gap um, where there's you've got the, the proven internationals and the experienced ones like like Liam Williams, half any, and then you've got the ones then who might not have had enough game time at regional level to to be thrown right into a test match situation. So it's going to be interesting to see how he plays it out. I think he'll have quite a few youngsters involved into the into the next World Cup. I think he's shown that by his training squad, he, he obviously put a few youngsters in there and a few people who was going to be exposed to international rugby for the first time, like Azarati, Domakowski and players like that. And they just, you know, I think the next four years is going to be a gradual build. They'll have, obviously they're going to miss Dan Bigger and 
everyone in Wales is going to miss Dan Bigger, but it, it's an exciting time to see what's next and who's going to be coming in and, and coming through. Yeah, um, I think for me, I think you've got that squad. I think that, you know, a lot of these boys, uh, you know, Biggs, Sanjay, Chicken, but they're gone. You know, I, Liam and Gareth haven't retired from international rugby, but they can't play the Six Nations. Big is gone. You have to imagine that uh, Penny is done. Same with uh, Idiot. Um, you know, these boys, they're, they're well into their 30s now. I think that if they're out. I think it's a really big opportunity for like, sort of, you know, at fullback Tom Rogers. Um, unfortunately, you know, Matthew Morgan, who did re- announce his retirement just you know, years ago. So, Andy Howell, if you are listening, and I know you are, I'm sorry. There'll be no nipper at fullback uh, for you. I thought you wanted uh, to. Oh, you wanted him at 10. Oh, that's even worse. I um, think it might have been a 10. I can't remember. I remember the entire debate about that, but I thought you wanted him at 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a prediction out there that we see Dan Edwards in a Wales camp um, at some point in the next year. Not necessarily in the squad, but there definitely is some sort of like Eddie Jones apprentice type player. I think we're, we're really, really thin on 10s of quality. Um, uh, Will Reed, I don't think is there yet. I think he's another one that we'll definitely see there as an apprentice. Um, but yeah, and I like Will Reed. I liked what I saw of him against the Ospreys last year. He takes it to the line really well. Um, I think you know, Sheedy. I I still think Callum Sheedy should have made that move to Cardiff. Um, maybe he will next year. Um. I think Owen Williams will probably will see in that ten shirt in Six Nations. Would would I want him to? He's thirty one now, thirty two, something like that. You know, he's not been his best in a Wales shirt. And would, does he does he suit Alex King's playbook? Look, there's all these different things. I think we're 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 looking good in the pack. Five especially, Reese Davis, David Jenkins to come in. Uh, in the back row, Chris Chun's, uh I think we'll see Morgan Morris in that Six Nations squad. You know, he he rarely has a bad season. Will Griffiths can potentially work his way into that squad. Um, he's a very versatile player. Gatlin likes that. Um, and then up front, look, tight head. We know we're still on the ground at tight head. I have my problems with Azarati and Leon Brown. Um, but Leon Brown is a Six Nations winner. And he was raw then, and he's got a, got a run of games now where he's effective in the carry and he's good in the in the set piece. That's it. That's all Leon Brown has to prove, I think. And then yes. I'm going to be controversial. Chris Henry for Wales. We haven't got any tight heads, right? Thomas Francis won't be around forever. Neither will Henry Thomas. Reese Henry or Wales get it trending on Twitter, on X, whatever you want to call it. Hashtag Reese Henry for Wales. Yeah, it, it, that's that's a, a quite a shock. Um, but then, then again, thinking about it, there's not many props that can play on both sides, like oh. Reese Henry can. So. You ne you never know. It might be another apprenticeship style Gatlin selection that he might do a Rodri Jones and just tell him to pick a, a side and stick to it. Look, Rodri Jones somehow got all them gaps to Wales. I don't know how he did. But that brings us to the end of our Wales v Argentina review. Uh we won't talk about the other quarterfinals. They were amazing. But we'll leave that to to the Irish podcasts, uh, I'm sure they have their views uh, on New Zealand's win against Ireland. Let, let's get into the proper rugby. Let's get into why we're here, the Ospreys. It's pre-season, a long pre-season. Um, first off, Darren, how do we think 
Went. We we lost against the Dragons by one point, but Dave Parade, and then we won narrowly thanks to missed uh, kick against Cardiff at the dot com. What are your thoughts on preseason? Well, a mixture of positives and negatives. Really, obviously, lost to the Dragons, but uh, you know the boys haven't played together in so many months, so maybe. It, Maybe a bit rusty in match fitness, and obviously getting a nice win to end preseason against uh, Cardiff. But yeah, Toby both seems happy with preseason. It's been a long one. Just gonna get started on the season now and see, uh, where we at and to see if we're gonna have a steady season or it's gonna be one of those seasons where it's gonna be a hit and a miss. Will we win a couple of games? Will we lose a couple of games? Just gonna wait and find out. But excited now for the new season to see where we are as a pack and a squad and to see where we are. West, pre-season, what are your thoughts? Um, Long. I know a couple, a couple of people that I'm quite friendly with, they were they were thinking. That I remember speaking to one of the boys and um, I joked saying there was an X amount of Dave until uh, the first pre-season games and I don't think I can repeat, repeat the response I got. Um... But uh, in let's say it was uh, quite a frustration at how long it was. But um, but yeah, you know, I think it's 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 just good to be back. Really, very, you know, we've seen what's going on in England. I think as supporters, we should be really glad that we've still got a team in. Well, we've still got four regions to begin with. I think that's 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 good news to begin with. And but we're just glad that we can go and watch. You know the Ospreys week in week out, whereas unfortunately some supporters in England, particularly Worcester, Jersey Reds, Wasps, and the Irish, you know they they don't have that, and we should be you know if if you're an Osprey supporter, just try your very best, just get to a game, um at, at all throughout the season. If it's just one, or you fork out money for a season ticket, you know. We just should be really happy that there's four regions still knocking around and we're still going to have regional derbies at Christmas. And it's okay, results might not be there due to off field issues, but but you know, it's 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 just good to be back in the in the in the URC and, and have regular games again. Absolutely, I think I I said after the Cardiff game, it's the preseason I expected. I, you know, when I saw that squad go up to, to Dave Parade, I thought, yeah, we come away with anything within five points there. I think that's a, that's a result. Um, and judging by, you know, reading the forums, the Facebook posts and speaking to people, we clearly went in with a game plan there saying, all right, it's not necessarily about winning. It's about performance. You know, we weren't kicking penalties, which is something that, I think the Ospreys are renowned for. We do kick our goals. Um, and then you can clearly see the progression then when we get into the Cardiff game where we look to play a bit more, um, get the ball in hand a bit. You know, we scored four tries, converted all four. So there's a clear progression there. Um, I, I, I Boothie said, and as ACJ said two weeks ago, Long preseason, a lot of challenges. Unfortunately, we're in the position where we can't uh, afford them long, them big star studded players. You know, you look at Bristol bringing in the likes of Vak Tower, um, and 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 like that. You know, I'd love, we'd love to do that. Bath bringing in Finn Russell, um, you know, whereas Cardiff bringing in Tina's to be a you know, and that's no slight on Tabia. I'm sure he's a, a very capable player, but I think every Cardiff fan would rather a Finn Russell. But we have to be realistic in where we are. And I'm actually really positive because it's given some uh, really good opportunities to young players to have a full preseason and extra with with Booth and Co. You know, the likes of Rodri Lewis, uh, Cam Jones, um, you know, boys who be in the necessary fringes of the European squad, but they they've been in and around that environment. Lewis Jones, um, Fender, 
Justin Davis, you know, boys like Harry Houston, who probably next season are going to make that jump into regional rugby. It gives them that opportunity, gives them that step in stone. And then you've got the likes of Morgan Morse, Dan Edwards, um, boys who've been in the 20s this year, ready to make that step. Um, and I firmly believe we'll see them too, especially. Um, Tom Florence would be another one, but I know he's just had surgery on his hamstring. Um, but it would be, yeah, them three would definitely be the ones where I thought, yeah, you'll see them in Osprey shirt semi-regularly this season. That does lead me into recruitment. You know, we brought in uh, some skimmers, some hookers, some of the... The big losses, we won't go into the, the negatives, but I think the main thing is we brought in young uh, Welsh talent um, who who will just get better. Luke Davis looked really good coming off the bench against Cardiff. He looked sharp. You know, he, he is really great. I'm speaking to, speaking to a guy who was in the 20s squad with him. Um, really, really capable scrum half. And, and I think that that competition with Ruben this season will be a really, really good, really good thing for us. Let's look to the weekend. URC is back. The Ospreys kick off their URC campaign with arguably the toughest away game. I think, yes, and you said this one of the three worst games we could have gotten behind Art Scarlet and Rocky Parade. Is that right? Yes, I think probably. Scarlet's away is de- probably the toughest due to our recent results down there. Uh, Dragons away second because we don't win. Um, we we very rarely do at Rodney Parade, and then probably Connacht away third, closely followed by a trip to South Africa. But you have no clue what the weather is going to be like in in Galway. At any time of day, anything could happen. So yeah, it's probably one of the trickier. Starts of the season for such a young squad. If it was a home game, you'd feel a little bit more confident. But as it's away, you're thinking, oh, this could be a a little bit of a tricky ask for, for such a young squad. Darren, uh, how are we feeling? Positive or are we feeling a bit apprehensive? A bit of both, really. You know, we don't know what to expect from these players. They could come out and like shock, shock the whole URC and like be so impressive or they could go completely opposite and just get destroyed by every team going but I'm not going to I'm not going to be negative I'm going to try and remain positive as much as I can we don't know what's going on behind the scenes we could be in for a great season but you know calling it away first game could be you know a bigger game going forward or you know could kick us could, could kick us off brilliantly but that's snow, rain, sleet, heavy winds, yeah. we don't know. But yeah, I'm going to remain positive and the boys, as long as the boys give it give it their all and put 100% into every tackle and win every ruck and maul, then I'm going to be confident and we're going to go up there and do our best. That's all I can ask for. Absolutely. Yeah. I think let, let, looking at Connor to second, uh, I've done my research. Um, past form isn't great. I think we did win in the 2019 2020 season, or it might be 2020 21. Um, it, yeah, it, it was, but past form has not been great. Um, I think when everyone ever mentions Connor, it's the conditions, you know, going out there in a storm. Not going to be if you're expecting the ball being thrown around and passes and you know things like that. I think you're you're looking at the wrong game uh, for that. Looking at Connacht squad, um, obviously the big the three notable players, yeah, Ethan Elam and Hanson, uh, won't be available. Uh, Peter Wilkins, their head coach, has said two to three weeks. Um, Connacht's recruited well. Over the summer, uh, I think the four that stand out really: Sean Jansen, Santiago Cordero, and Joe Joyce. Um, some really, really experienced 
and capable players. Jansen and Cordero are out. Jansen still rehabbing an injury, and Cordero unfortunately injured his knee two weeks ago. So we'll be they they, they said around March time. So that's it for him. Fantastic player. I was really looking forward to seeing him in a Connacht shirt. But I think we can expect to see Hanrahan. Um, obviously, most recently, the Dragons um, really steadied the ship at 10 there. I think, look, I'm not saying Dragons copied us and signing a veteran 10, um, but he, he, he was basically the Irish Stephen Myler. And Joe Joyce, who has been at the heart of that Bristol pack, who are right, not necessarily known for their raw power, but he is a very capable, capable lot. I expect to see him uh, involved at the weekend. Uh, in the press conference, it talks about the Ospreys being big ball carriers, very physical um, and well organised. I, I, I don't know what Ospreys have been watching, um, but that, that doesn't sound like us. But no, I, I think. And Toby Booth's comments are exactly the same. A tough place to go. They're a very committed team, very confrontational. In the reverse fixture last year, which I believe we lost by three points, was it yesterday? Yeah, 20, three points. 20, I think it finished. They were very confrontational. Um, I, I think you know we we I'm really excited um, for this weekend. I, I think we've got a more than capable squad to go out there and get a result. Um, and it all just all depends on how far we've come. I, I think there's a real opportunity for this young squad. I think, I've said this on record, that we've got the best squad out of all the regions. Actually, the Dragons have the second best squad recently. Um, but I also think we've got the best youngsters as well. I think if you, if, if, you know, if Morgan Morris, touch wood, this never happens, but he did have to drop out with injury. I'd be more than happy to see Morgan Morse step up into that eight jersey. If tips went down, Harry Deves took that seven jersey. You know, if Owen goes down, Jack Walsh will step up with Dan Edwards then coming in at, at that backup ten slot. Do you know, it's, I, I'm not. I wouldn't be worried. Um, going, going away, Connacht. You know, I think these boys play for the badge. They believe in the in the journey. Um, I, I, and hearing every time I hear Toby Booth talk, I'm just yeah, I'd run through a brick wall for that man. Um, who do we think is going to be named our club captain this season? There's been club captain name in week. Uh, Ollie Griffiths has been announced as the Dragons captain. Um, Josh Turnbull has been announced as the Cardiff uh, bus passer. I mean, uh, club captain. And Josh McLeod, the Spanish Steve Tandy, has been announced as the Scarlet Club captain. Who, who do we think is going to be named our club captain this season? Darren, who do, who do you think? Um, I'm not too sure. Hopefully, I, I, I hope it's Morgan Morris. Okay, left field. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yes, then. What about you? Um, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but... If we go back to August, Toby Booth tweeted something about Jack Morgan and the, about him being captain. I think it was for the Wales' first World Cup warm-up. But I I still think it'll be Tipperick. Just. That's what I think. I think Ips will be named club captain. Um, I think the temptation to, to name Jack as captain is there. I think uh, with Six Nations coming around, he'll be involved in the Barbars match. Um, Tipperick is, is just the logical option. Um, you've got leaders in that squad. Uh, Reese Davis, Nicky, uh, Nicky, he's not with Wales, Will Griff. Um, I could see Ruben maybe captain in at some point in this season if it comes to it. Um yeah, so I, I def I definitely think Tips will be that will be that leader going forward. Um, let's look ahead to the squad. Then, 
Um, I did ask you to do your homework, lads. Squad predictions for the weekend. I will go first for my 23. I think that Toby Booth is going to take out uh, Garen Phillips at one, Sam Parry at two, Tom Bolter at three, Reese Davis and Will Griff in the ball. Harry Deves, Justin Tipperick, and Morton Morris in the back row. Ruben starts at nine. Owen Williams at 10. Uh, Kieran Williams at 12 with Don Morris at 13. Uh, and then Keelan Giles, Matt Prothero, and Mitch Nagy make it my back three. On the bench, then, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Ethan Lewis, uh, replacement hooker. Nicky Smith, if he is available, goes straight onto the bench. I'm going off having many minutes at the World Cup. I think he played like some hundred minutes at the World Cup. But from my understanding, Wales players will get two weeks off minimum and it will be uh, uh, dealt with on a player-to-player basis. Um, so the likes of Adam Beard, who played nearly every part of that. And Jack Morgan will get probably a bit longer. Um, so in that case, I'll go Reese Henry at Loose yes, Loosehead. Ben Warren comes in on tight head then. Uh, I've gone Hugh Sutton, but it could easily be Jack Regan because I know uh, he is still knocking about that squad. James Ratty, Luke Davis, Jack Walsh, and then Owen Kim to finish... Yes, Tim. Um, I've kind of gone very similar to yourself, James. So I think the pack is all the same. Um, I think the only change I've got, I've got Luke Morgan in on the right wing instead of um Matt Prothero. I'm just he only had sixty minutes against um the Dragons, so I'm a bit, a bit uh, a bit a little bit worried that you know might not have enough fitness to start in a you know, in the competitive fixture of the URC. So I've got Luke Morgan on the wing with Keelan Giles moving to 11 and Nagy at fullback. And then on the bench, it's a pretty similar situation to you. I think we did we did talk about this in the week. So, um, yeah. So we, we both came to an agreement that Nicky Smith would be on the bench, but we've also got Reese Henry on there just in case Smith isn't back in time. Uh, so Reese Henry replacement who said Ben Warren replacement tight meadow. I must say he held up he held the scrum very well second half against Cardiff in right. season. He is the size of a small house. I was quite impressed that uh, I I thought I thought that Henry would be um I thought Henry was maybe a bit in, more in front. Obviously we've seen Reese Henry perform in Champions Cup games, but credit to Warren, he he came in and, and did a good job. And then uh, the rest of the the, the bench is the same, and I've included Owen Watkin as my twenty third man, just just in case Prothero isn't fit. Okay, and then Darren, are we looking at something similar? The field choices. Yeah, something similar. Um, I probably would start Kieran Williams and Owen Williams, and uh, not Owen. Sorry. Um. What I yeah, oh, walking. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, at twelve and thirteen, I think Dom Dom Morris, because he's injury prone. I don't want to like chuck him in there straight away, only because um Owen Walking and William Sam play much. Um, obviously didn't get paid pick for Wales, so I think it's their chance to shine. Um, for the Ospreys and uh, stake their claim for Six Nations, maybe. Um. Now I get fifteen for me. Um, um, I'd start. Um, Reece Henry. At uh, loose head, and then maybe see hopefully Nicky Smith and a few of the Wales boys returning on the bench. The ones who didn't get to play that much, but I'd like to see Toby Fricker on the bench as well. Start Luke Morgan and Giles, and then check him out. Like. Matt Fricker is another one that I, I went over in my head. I think he'll definitely travel with the squad. Um, I, he didn't actually get as much an opportunity as I like against Cardiff, but I don't think he has trained with the squad enough at that point. 
I can definitely see if he does perform, I can see him definitely pushing his way into that starting lineup. He's absolute gas. I don't think he starts over Giles. I think Giles is a vastly underrated player. He makes his tackles. This is one. Um, defensively spacing, I think is brilliant. Obviously, we know what he can do going forward. I, I, you know, your Cabangos, your your Pombias, your Tom Rogers. I think he's the original. You know, he's been doing this since he was what he was about eighteen when he made his debut for for the Ospreys. Playing, he played in that dynasty under twenty squad. Um, which won the Grand Slam um, alongside Ruben, who was still at Ascal Gavras Levera at the time. Shout out, yes, then. Yeah. He convey a belt of Welsh rugby somehow, and they've gone four from four in the Colleges League. Uh, I, I, I was only did rugby, but was around. Nice College and Osprey's adjacent setups at the time, and I can tell you that Ruben is a freak. She's the person I know, um, but yeah, that's like a conveyor belt talent. That'll be an interesting one battle between Luke Davis and Ruben going forward. Um, Ruben obviously has the experience now, well over fifty caps for the Ospreys. New deal signed. Is time to shine this season as the number one. You know, nowhere be any more. Um, yeah, so Ruben Ruben goes in at number one. Will Luke Davis oust him? I don't think so, but it's a really, really good, um, really, really good chance for him. And then the other one I've got signing wise, I think, as the potential is James Ratty. He comes back with a point to prove from Cardiff. Played well for Cardiff a lot. You know, did really well to go from being dropped by the Ospreys, picked up by, by the Rags in Cardiff. Played really well, gave himself a contract, um, and then played in a, a, a glutton back row. Um, I know he played a bit of second row as well, but. Where does he fit into that back row, Yestin? Or does he come off the bench? Um, it, it, you know, if well, it, depend, it really depends what what Ruth's looking for, really, because you could have Deves a six, but then you could either have either um, well, you could have Tipperick a six, and in, in, in a different world, he's, he's he's I'm pretty sure he's played there before. And but then you could either either one of Morgan Morris or James Ratty at six with the other one at eight, and you could you know if, if they if they're looking at to keep line up ball and maybe use use them all a bit more you can have Ratty in that back row to accommodate that, or maybe as an option off the bench you know he's more than capable he's, he's a very strong carrier and you know if if they need if they need someone to sort the line up twenty minutes ago, then. In comes Ratty to come in for either Deves or, or Morris, and then they can slot them in the six or eight. And maybe the other occasion you might have to go into the second row. Uh, it looks like the Ospreys are okay there with, with Reese Davis and Will Griffiths. Um, quite a good big fan of James Fender as well. I think he, he looked quite promising when he played against Benetton last season. Yeah. And, and, and you know, yeah, there's, there's plenty of options for Ratty. Mainly because of his versatility, but I think he would probably start on the bench to begin with. Then maybe when he did, or if injuries occur, then I think he, he might come into the um to the back row. Perfect. Right, I'm aware of time. Time is getting on, so let's finish with well. Firstly, what's our score predictions for the weekend? I'm going to write. I'm going to write these down. And come back to next week. So, Darren, what's our predictions for Arnold away? I'm going to be completely honest and I'm going to say Connaught 32, Ospreys 17. So, that is 
32-17 Hornets. Listen. Um, no, I really don't want to be negative, so you could conditions allow and you could end nine six either way, but um oof. Hornets empty, Nospreys twelve. I predicted a bigger margin earlier on in the week, but I think it'll be a little bit closer, mainly mainly because of weather conditions more than anything. So yeah, seventeen twelve, Ospreys get a losing bonus point. I hope it's not one of those games like last season where we let it slip. Yeah, I certainly hope that. I'm going to be the black sheep of the podcast and I'm going to predict a 15-22 win for the Ospreys. Um, I think it's going to be a really tight affair. Um, the referee in is going to be big. Obviously, with the World Cup going on, the hot URC refs, um, I'm looking at you, Frank. Um, ben White Towns as well. Yeah, basically that mob, they're all at the World Cup or referee in Cardiff. Um, also, we, we've been paired with someone doing his second URC game. Um, so look, the referee is going to be a big, big part of it. Um, if Ospreys can keep... 15 players on the pitch for 80 minutes. I'll count that as a win. We like going out to, to Ireland and to South Africa and deciding to play with 14 men. I don't know why we do it. Um, that game is live on S4C. That's three o'clock. Or is it the later kickoff? No, it is three o'clock. The, the URC have got an awful schedule this week. There's the Ospreys are on a three, then the Dragons are on a five past three. So if you want to watch both games, tough, you've had it. And there's no evening kickoff either. So you've got Cardiff uh, playing Benetton and Munster against the Sharks at the same time. So um, if the URC could politely change kickoff times for future rounds so I could watch a couple of games and not watch them both at the same time, that would be very nice. Unfortunately, I won't be able to watch that game uh, at all because I will be playing... And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what you get when you move to to England. I will be playing in the Isle of Wight this weekend, uh, much as the the delight of the Hampshire leagues. So I will be crossing a ferry at some point. Uh, And my kickoff is at three o'clock. So no Ospreys game for me. So I will return to changing rooms, either having won or lost, to see uh, an Ospreys result. Let's move to who do we think is going to be the Ospreys' top scorer this season, Darren? I'm going to back him, and I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay with what I said from the very beginning, and I'm going to say Keelan Giles' top try scorer. So, top. So I am writing this down to come back to top scorer, Darren. It's going to go with Giles. Yes, then. Uh, set piece and vibes, Sam Parry. Set piece and vibes. He's a man after my own heart, Sam Parry. And then I personally think that Ruben Morgan Williams is going to get the most tries this season. Um, he always seems to score, but yet always seems to end up on about three tries. I don't know where they go. Um, I think also if we're counting European tries, um. Keenan Giles definitely comes out on top because he loves scoring in the Challenge Cup. Uh, and then finally, to finish, hopefully optimistically, where do we think we're going to finish up in the league um, at the end of the year? Bearing in mind that now the top eight are the ones that qualify for the Champions Cup. Yes, Dan? Um, Tenth. I think Benetton are going to pip us somehow. And then I, I think the four... Irish and South Africans will probably be a bit too strong. But earlier on in the week, I did not put Ospreys as shield winners, but now maybe looking at the squads again, I'm a little bit more confident. Shield winners. Darren? I'm going to say I'm going to finish ninth. I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say we're going to finish ninth this season. Ninth. And do you think we win the Welsh Shield? Yes, because we've got the best squad available, unlike the others. 
Now, I don't normally agree with Scarlet's fans because I think all their opinions are trash. But I agree with Lee on the rap that I think we're underplaying ourselves a bit. I do think Ospreys will finish eighth. Um, I think it'll come down to a tussle with Edinburgh Benetton. And, you know, I hope Emilio Emilio Pacelli misses all his kicks and that, you know, Jacob Umaga does the same. Um, So I think I'm going to go eight, and I also think we're going to win the Shield where we battle it out with the Dragons this season. I, 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 Jamie doesn't want to hear this, but I really, really am excited about that Dragon squad. Game Blacker, they've, uh, they've recruited well. They've got experience in the likes of Lydia. Clay Evans is going to be huge for them. Um, depending on how involved he is with Wales, um, can they keep Ollie Griffiths free? Same with Harrison Caddy. Um, so yeah, I think we'll we'll, we'll battle it out with um, with the Dragons for the Shield. So eighth, ninth, and tenth, um, you're pretty pretty consistent. I think that is that for this week, boys. So may, thank may you. I have one final prediction. Oh hello. That the European curse will end. I think we'll oh in a knockout game in Europe. Ooh. You think we'll win? Write that down. Knockout game in Europe. That so who who are our group games? Montpellier and Benetton, Montpellier, Perpignan, and the Lions. It's it's doable. Like stranger things have happened. If you'd have asked me before last year, I would have said we don't have a hope in hell. But we've beaten Montpellier. Well, we let's not say we've beaten. We destroyed Montpellier. Um, in in France, we've swatted away Leicester, who are a shell of themselves now after being demolished by us last year. Uh, and you know, Benetton we've beaten before. Um, Bignon, I forgot, still existed. And the only one I fear there is the Lions because we played them away. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've. I don't think we've ever played the Lions at home. Yeah. Well, we have. We have. Oh, yeah, we did, of course. And we lost by a point. Please. Oh, yeah, forgot about that. Thank you, Jack Walsh. I don't even think it was Walsh's fault. I'd be brutally honest. I know he missed the penalty that he, night. He did. He, he he did. He missed that penalty, but I love him. I love him with all my heart. I'm putting the blame on Reese Webb myself. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic place to end it on. Gents, thank you so much for giving up your evening. As I said, UNC fever is gripping the nation. Aaron, I hope you recover. Thank you. We will be back same time next week to dissect the Connacht versus Ospreys game. Have a little chat about uh, the other regions as well, briefly. Maybe just gush over Reese Henry a bit more. <laughs> so I've been James, joined by Darren and Yestin. That is the Ospreys IRE podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Ospreys IRE podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to us as it really helps spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels or email us on welshregionalrugbypod at gmail.com. And remember, whatever the question, rugby is always the answer. Sports Social Podcast Network.